Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the e seminar series for uh, uh, transitional biomedical engineering. I'm very pleased to uh, host uh, Dr. Goshia uh, Wildarczyk Began uh, today. She is going to talk about uh, 3D bioprinting and biomaterials. Uh, but before we start, uh, as always, uh, 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 I would like to make a few uh, housekeeping uh, announcements. Uh, uh, during the talk, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box. Uh, this will help us to, uh, to you know, better manage your questions. Um, however, feel free to communicate with, uh, with the participants and also the speaker uh, uh, via the chat box. Uh, there is also a poll here. Uh, available that you can uh, share your thoughts with us and then provide us with uh, with feedback. Uh, our next speaker uh, will be uh, uh, Professor Carl Eric Oban uh, from Polytechnic Montreal. Uh, he will be talking uh, about uh, his research and then also his role uh in the uh, uh transmet tech institute uh, uh, uh next week so we're looking forward to dr aban's talk uh, next week uh also we have uh, a list of uh speakers lined up for the uh spring uh series uh, uh as you can see uh in, in the list uh, we have stellar speakers lined up and after dr carl eric aban we have Amir Mambachi from John Hopkins, and then uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Sherdown from McMaster University, and so on and so forth. So we have a, a, a list, a big list of uh, uh, stellar speakers uh, for, um, for, for the spring. And then uh, also uh, we will share the list of our summer speakers shortly with you. So we have a, a very, uh, exciting talks for the for the summer uh, for that i highly recommend you to uh to follow us on on twitter uh, uh so this is our twitter handle trans lbme and then uh, also share your thoughts and feedback uh, with us via email uh by sending uh an email to me uh, and and human as the organizers of this uh event uh Last but not least, I would like to uh, thank our uh, uh, sponsor, Montreal Transmet Tech Institute, who has been with us uh, since almost the beginning of these series. Uh, they're always uh, supporting us. Thank you very much, Montreal Transmet Tech. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Gashia uh, Wuladerchek Began, uh, uh, who is a principal investigator at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And then from March 1st, which is like a few days away, uh, she will uh, start her position as an assistant professor at the Silesian University of Technology in Poland. Uh, her research is focused on applying 3D bioprinting technique to generate uh, complex scaffolds of polymeric materials for advanced tissue regeneration. Uh, she's also interested in the rational design and development of novel polymer-based bionics with tunable properties, uh, allowing to uh, induce a specific cellular response to produce systems with bioinstructive uh, properties. Uh, she has earned her master's degree in Poland in uh, psychology, uh, but interestingly, she decided to uh, to uh, continue uh, in the field of biomedical engineering uh, later on in the, in the PhD, although she has done some work in the area of biomedical engineering in her master's too. Uh, she obtained the, um, her PhD in uh, January of 2016 at the uh, Wageningen University and the uh, research center in the uh, in the Netherlands working on recombinant proteins for biomedical applications. Uh, 
Uh, in the years uh, 2016 to 2020, she was employed at the uh, INM uh, Leibniz uh, Institute for New Materials in Germany as a postdoctoral uh, researcher. Um, uh, there, she took on the challenge to set up from uh, scratch and supervise uh, the bioprinting lab. Um, in 2017, she was awarded a UNESCO L'Oreal uh, for Women in Science Prize in recognition of her research uh, qualities and ability to combine excellence in science with being uh, a mother, which is, which I, I should confess it's very, very difficult and uh, well-deserved. Uh, currently, she is working in the polymer science group at the University of Groningen, where she has recently received three prestigious grants from the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. Uh, she has also been awarded the uh, NAWA Polish Returns Grant in 2019, uh, uh, which is intended to set up her own research group in Poland, and also a couple of uh, national grants from uh, from the Polish uh, funding agencies. Uh, so uh, her plan is to start uh, with, with all these resources to start a young research group, and then uh, create an international uh, collaboration collaborative team. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, to invite. Uh, Gracia uh, to uh, to the virtual floor and uh, by sharing her uh, screen with us uh, and uh, I'm very excited and looking forward to hearing your your talk uh, so you're muted so let me just see if I can yes yes and but you just cannot uh, see my screen yet right you cannot see your screen yet yeah okay thank you very much Mohsen for a very nice um, presentation um, and for, thank you um, also for inviting me to, to give a talk here. It's a big pleasure and honor for me. Um, actually, you spoiled a few of my first slides uh, when I was showing uh, kind of my career path, but then I will go just through it a bit um, more uh, quickly. But then, um, uh, just one second. Let me then first show actually uh, how all the steps that you mentioned uh, so how i was uh, kind of moving within the europe it's uh, it's not uh, like uh, the, the distances are not super big so the movement was not enormous but still it uh, especially um, to combine it with family as you as you mentioned it, it's quite a challenge um, to jump from country to country but then i, I started in in krakow so on the south of poland and then i moved indeed for my phd to wageningen so to, to the netherlands and then I hopped down, uh, like more to the south, uh, to Germany, uh, to Saarbrücken. And from that moment, I sort of like uh, follow my steps back. So first I moved uh, back to Netherlands and now I'm um, in the moving uh, period uh, and the transition to back to Poland, close to my, um, uh, to the city where, where I was uh, studying. Uh, so um, to Gliwice, which is uh, also on the south of, of Poland. Um, so in, um, in 2005, indeed, I started my master thesis, and then uh, I started to do it in uh, first uh, psychology. But at some point, I realized, okay, that's not not really what I want to do. But because I generally have a problem to to stop doing what I already started, which uh, sometimes it's uh, tough, um, I decided to, to to follow the path, and I finished in the end master in psychology and bi in biomedical engineering. Uh, and then master in biomedical engineering actually brought me to Netherlands in that sense that I um, went for Erasmus exchange to Nijmegen and then I thought I, I, I see that uh, Timothy Douglas is with us today so then he was my supervisor in Nijmegen and uh, actually um, that was the start of um, of the idea to, to actually stay abroad and um, to go more deeply into the science. So I decided uh, that after finishing my uh, master I will uh, do a PhD uh, in biomedical engineering and specifically I was working on recombinant proteins for bone regeneration so I was uh, using uh, modified yeast preparing some hydrogel material that uh, was supporting um, regeneration of bones and then in 2016 indeed I moved to INM so Institute for New Materials in Saarbrücken um, in Germany where I was setting up um, as Moxen mentioned a bioprinting lab 
Um, and there I was also working in the international project on uh, Mesenheimer stem cells and how to uh, make them proliferate and grow more efficiently. And one of the main things that I learned there is also how important it is to make like this a big network of collaborators with different expertise from different countries that this um, make uh, the work more attractive and also give a lot of input from different people and many different ideas. And then in 2020, so last year, I moved to, to Netherlands uh, for a postdoc position. But here, as um, as mentioned, I, I obtained my own grants. So by now, I'm kind of self-funded. And also the PhD students who work very closely with me, they are self-funded because you wrote the grants together. So that gives also some kind of a freedom and uh, possibility to really decide what we want to do, um, as we are pretty independent in that sense. Um, and this year, it's a also, also a special year because I will be combining my work uh, still in Netherlands uh, with the assistant professor po uh, position in um, Silesian University of Technology in Poland, where I also received the grants, which allows me to build a um, self-funded group, uh, which we call Biofabrication and Bioinstructive Materials Group. Um, and all in all, what I learned in the past years is actually that it is pretty nice to have your own funding because this gives you a lot of freedom, especially in academia. It's nice in that sense that if you are undecided like me with uh, your career, you are also sometimes kind of undecided what you want to do in science. But I think in a positive sense that you can uh, really cover different disciplines and you can um, cover different areas of biomedical engineering in my, um, in, in, uh, my case. Um, and then your own funding gives you this freedom to really choose and change a bit uh, your field of interest. And I also learned that it's very important to be integrated uh, with the network of, um, of other scientists from different countries. That is a really huge and positive input and that the amount of information and the amount of uh, ideas that you get from it, it's, it's really um, very special. And also the last thing that I think is the main thing that I learned is that collaborate, collaboration with doctors and clinicians, it's very useful. And I really like this kind of a discussion where you can go to them and ask, what do you actually need? What we can help with? And then you start thinking how you can do it from the material perspective. Um, so I think it was a lot of teaching experience in the recent years. And this brought me to this point where I'm now uh, with building the biofab biofabrication and bioinstructive material group. Um, and what we want to do there is actually we want to cover, let's say, three main fields. So we want to focus on the cell material interactions to see like on the basic science, from a basic science perspective, how this goes and how the cell interact uh, with the materials that we want to develop. And the idea is that by this we can uh, construct this uh, so-called bioinstructive material so that we, we can kind of have a common language with the cells and tell them more or less like where we want them to go and what we want them to do, how we want them to differentiate. <laughs> and the, the final goal is um, to prepare the in to, to, to be able to prepare and develop the in vitro models that are more adequate so that they will, in the end, reduce, for example, the animal testing uh, amount and um, they will give uh, like a very adequate response or the, the answers to our questions. And also, we want to go into the direction of customized input. And for this, we are focusing on 3D bioprinting and melt electro writing. I think that especially 3D bioprinting was covered many times uh, in this e series, but uh, maybe melt electro writing is still unknown for some people. So I will uh, give some information on about these techniques. And our research focus is, let's say, um, on the three main areas. So first uh, is developing advanced materials, and it was my starting point in, in the way how I was developing my um, my research area um, and research focus in general. Then we are working also on advanced printable designs when we kind of forgot forget for a moment about um, different types of materials and functionalization. We just really think only about the designs and architectures. And then finally, on advanced printable systems where we kind of combine an advanced materials and advanced printable designs. Uh, to go into the direction of these in vitro models and um, tissue engineering. Um, so to start with, I, I mentioned that uh, we want to obtain our goals using 3D bioprinting. And the 3D bioprinting is, I, I think, very fascinating uh, field and everybody is pretty excited uh, when, when you mention, oh, I'm doing 3D bioprinting. 
but the truth is also that we are not as far as we thought that we will be by uh, in 2020 when when we think about bioprinting so when you put in the google human organ bioprinting um phrase then you will see all these uh, fancy organs or uh, the printers that uh, they are printing ready hard and stuff like this and actually we are not yet there and one of the reason is that um there is still need for a functional and really advanced printable materials and that's the primar primary reason why i um why me and uh, the people who are working with me decided to go more into this direction. So the main difficulty to obtain these uh, printable materials, which are advanced and have a um, proper function is that the, the requirements for them are pretty broad and they need to, we, we need to kind of meet many requirements in one material, in one system. So bio inks for printing, um, usually they, they are composed of biomaterial and living cells, which already make it very complicated. But on top of this, um, the, the biomaterial needs to be um, to have a good properties regarding printing itself. So we say that it needs to have a good flow that it's easily uh, extrudable or it's ex easily deposited on the printing stage. But on the other hand, it needs to be very quickly cured so that we can fix the shape that we are printing. So this is already challenging. Uh, additionally, it needs to be biocompatible. If we have cells in it, it's, um, it's kind of... Um, obvious but even if we want to print without cells and see the cells later on the material still needs to needs to be biocompatible and not cytotoxic and finally on top of this it's coming the the need for um, having a special properties which are um, connected to the application of the construct that we are building so tissue specific properties so to meet all of this in one system is pretty challenging and that's the main reason why um, the really advanced inks are not yet there. So to start with, we are working on these advanced uh, materials, advanced inks. Um, and uh, when we think about tissue specific properties, for example, it's one of the well-known thing is that, to, that our tissues have a different stiffness. So already to meet this very simple requirement in the ink that you can uh, print um, with different stiff, uh, with uh, print the materials with a different final stiffness, it's, it's not so easy. And then, as a, like a starting point, we are just trying to adjust different material systems that are already well known and they are well printable to make it even better, to give them better stability, to get a better resolution of printing, to be able to print like a really more advanced shapes and, and more functional um, uh, materials. And then from this idea, actually we went to, um, to the idea of uh, developing printable tissue groups. So let's imagine that we have these minimal invasive surgeries now and then we are making like very precise cuts and then we, we, we can really make a small hole in the body to make in the end a very complex operation inside wouldn't it be nice to have something which is really nicely printable or extrudable that you can uh, really precisely deliver it and it's gluing for example when you are making a cut that you don't need to make any sutures but you can really precisely glue it at the place and the other um, possible application for printable glues are all kinds of um, problems with the skin. For example, neurofibromatosis, it's a disease which is causing the tumors to grow in the nervous system. And one of the types of neurofibromatosis caused that um, there is a formation of a bumps, like you can see on this picture. Um, and there is no actually need, uh, known cure for the, for the disease. And sometimes when these tumors are getting very really cancerogenous, you need to remove them. And then the doctors have a problem. Sometimes it's a small cut, but sometimes it's also like that you are kind of having the whole, um, uh, the whole, so that you, you, you really have a gap or the, the space in the body that you need to fill in. And then we were thinking that the perfect solution for such a, such a problem would be to have a printable glue, which would mean that it's not only injectable so that you can really put it in the place and then glue like two pieces of the skin, but you really can build in the construct, which will really fill the hole you are making so that you are doing two things at the same time. You are gluing, but you are also like a scaffolding. Um, so there was our idea behind that we want to, to have something which has a very good adhesive properties, but it can also build up three dimensional objects. An additional benefit would be that in general for 3D printing, whatever you are printing, even if you don't need adhesion or gluing immediately, you need a connection between consecutive layers that you are printing. 
So then if they can really nicely stick to each other, that you have these adhesive properties in between the strands, it's also like a very big advantage of such a system. So coming back to this slide, we had idea, okay, we want to have a printable glues, but then we have this, let's say, three area of properties that we need to somehow address. So we started from these good flow properties versus fast curing. And that was not that easy to find a solution, how, how we can think about a material that, um, that is good, nicely flowing, but also uh, can fix the shape very quickly. But then if we look uh, into the nature uh, and into these uh, muscles, I think that they are like uh, one of the best studied um, organism uh, in material science. But what is very interesting for them um, is that they actually work as a small bioprinters. So we get inspired by them. Because what they are doing, uh, if they want to attach to the rock, and they can do it very, very strongly, uh, independent if it's uh, under the seawater or if it's over the seawater, but they can make uh, this very strong connection. And then they do it by uh, extending the foot. And then from this foot, they extrude actually the proteinous material. And then they are taking back the foot but the connection is done. So this material, when it's uh, in the contact with seawater because of the pH, because of the salt uh, and the metal ions that they are in the, uh, in the seawater, they are getting um, solidified. So actually this works like a small extrusion printer. And this happened, I, I will not go into too much of the chemistry, but uh, this happened because uh, of the presence of a DOPA and especially the catechol unit that, that it's marked on the, on the slide. And very interesting thing is that all of this that the, the, the muscles are doing, it's, uh, it's happening in the physiological conditions. So this gives also the idea that um, it could be used, the chemistry that muscles are using could be used also for biomaterial property, for uh, development of biomaterials and uh, for working with cells. Um, so uh, what's interesting about these uh, catechol groups and the catechol chemistry is that it has um, very good adhesive and cohesive properties. So the catechols um, can interact with the metal ions, which are all, for example, in the seawater. So then they are working like a kind of a cross-linker and we can have a network. Or they are working, for example, in the metal ions that are on the rocks, and then we have uh, very good adhesive properties. But they can also get activa activated to the quinone form, and then they are super active and can uh, interact also with organic surface. So then it, this would mean that they really can work nicely as a glue with, for example, human tissue but that they can also uh, self condensate and for, uh, again, the network. So what, um, let's say, uh, biomaterial people are doing, they are connecting this catechol group uh, with some uh, polymers or uh, to obtain the, the scaffolds. And in our case, we decided that we want to functionalize catechols with polyethylene glycol, which is one of the materials commonly used um, in biomedical applications, also in 3D printing. So that was our idea about good flow um, versus fast curing, that we, we, we see what the muscles can do and we try to do the same. Um, so we decided to, to use this PEC polyethylene glycol with dopamine and add some metal ions like we can have, for example, in the sea. And what is nice about such a system is that it's a dynamic system. So the metal ions uh, can interact with the catechols, but the, the interaction can be as well, let's say, released. So when we apply the pressure in the printer, um, I will try to to um, to show it to you here. So when we apply pressure and then um, the, the strand is going through the narrow needle, uh, we observe so-called shearing effect. So these interaction are for a moment, let's say, released. They are disappearing, and then we can nicely um, press out the material. But when it reaches the stage, the network is reformed. Uh, and it's cross-linking, crossing back, so we can obtain in the end a uh, nice scalp. And here I will again skip a chemistry, but uh, what is nice about the system is that it can be nicely or easily adjusted by playing, for example, with the metal ions that we are using or the pH um, of the ink. And then we went for some rheological characterization. And here, I think what is important is that uh, when we test the material with different metal ions, like we, we try aluminum, iron, and vanadium, we observe different behaviors. So we observe the different uh, relaxation times of the network. So the time that it's necessary after, um, let's say, um, this integration of this crosslink 
to, to, to come back. So it will tell us how long the material can keep the shape. And this we related to some printing condition. And so we check uh, what are the um, possibilities to print, what is the pressure and the speed of printing that we can apply. And then finally, what are the prints that we can obtain? And it was important because first of all, we said, okay, based on what we see, we can nicely print our uh, material when we um, add um, iron and vanadium. But we also say, uh, said, what, what are the printability windows? So this would give an idea if somebody else wants to print, not only us, but we want to, for example, deliver material to, to the doctors um, that uh, in case, for example, of vanadium, they are pretty restricted and maybe they don't have actually the, the printers that, that could do it. But in case of uh, our formulation with iron, there is a, like, a huge span of the parameters for printing. So in principle, which, whichever machine uh, you have that uh, can um, make extrusion printing, you could use it. But that was about a good flow. But now what uh, about biocompatibility? So we checked also our, um, our formulations. Uh, we are making some viability tests and we are also checking how the materials, uh, how the cells proliferate. But the conclusion we had is also that uh, although the vanadium was nicely printable, actually we cannot use it with the cells because we observed the toxic effect um, of the vanadium. We also thought that th there are some issues with the cell attachment um, when we have uh, this formulation and therefore like the, the choice that we made it's uh, that they spec with ion that's the that's the the most promising material for the printable inks uh, which have uh, adhesive properties and finally this adhesive property that i mentioned we needed to check also this one so what we did uh, we took a pieces of the uh, pig skin and then we put our glue in between then we press it for 30 seconds and we were um, pulling in uh, two different directions so kind of uh, tensile motion and then we observe um, that, um, that the, the pieces of the skin um, are disconnected and this in principle can happen in, in two ways so it can be interfacial failure which would mean that uh, adhesive properties are the weak points of our material or it can be cohesive failure when the material breaks like uh, inside, like within the material, um, the break happened, and this would mean that the cohesive uh, properties are the weak side. So what we observe, it's um, indeed the cohesive failure, but we also saw that the adhesive pro strength of our material is in between fibrin and cryonacrylate. So there are the two other materials which are commonly used, or um, they are in a normal use uh, by the surgeons. So we. we all in all, we are in a good range, and um, the material has a really big promise uh, to be applied or to, to find applications uh, in the clinics. So all in all, um, I would say that this was a pretty um, successful but also very enjoyable project that we showed that uh, what we developed, it's, it's a printable formulation with, which has a remark remarkable printing resolution when you consider uh, um, how difficult it is actually to print the hydrogels, and it has a very good adhesive and biocompatible properties. So we hope that uh, this, in the end, will uh, really help um, um, clinicians, in, especially in a, in, a, in a minimal invasive surgeries, but also uh, when we are thinking about this uh, um, skin uh, disease and the problems, how to fill in the gaps in the body and uh, have a curing properties. So that was a part on the, let's say, advanced materials. But then we thought, let's leave it for a moment and then go to um, printable designs, which are quite advanced, because that's also the advantage of 3D printing, that you can build up a complex structures. And here is a, like a small break. And so what you see, this is um, the Polish capital city. It's a war zone. But unfortunately, not everybody can see it like this. So there are some people who will just see a piece um, of this beautiful landscape. Some people will see even less. Um, and in the end, not so much will be possible to be seen anymore. And this is actually how the, how the world is seen by people with glaucoma. And glaucoma, it's a, it's a worldwide problem that um, actually touches people uh, everywhere. And it causes, um, of course, also um, big loss of uh, regarding the the money and the budget for the that is connected with medical treatment and what is also kind of a sad thing is that it's it in the end touching that people in 
any age, in all the ages, also kids. Um, and this is caused by the um, by the pressure from the from the aqua's humor that it's um, that it's uh, here uh, playing on the optic nerve. And the and the, the problem why it appears actually it's connected with a very very tiny structure, uh, which is so called human trabecular meshwork. And by now there is no no cure that it's known and uh, what people can do when they realize that they're really losing the vision and there is a problem with glaucoma, it's or use to use some drops or pills to decrease the pressure or actually the surgery surgery is done. But then it's usually done in that sense, like in that way that, um, that the doctor is just cutting the hole in the human trabecular meshwork. So in that sense, it's not really well controlled. And I think that now you already have a guess why I'm telling this. Um, so this, this structure, this trabecular meshwork, it's a very complex uh, hierarchical structure, uh, which is also very small. Mm, and it's kind of a draining this aqueous humor, and it's it's made it's, it's a kind of a membrane. And we made our own model of it, which is consisting of a three regions with a very well de de designed uh, pore size, um, and the the thickness of the whole structures is also very small because it's smaller than one millimeter. And then it it seems like a very good um, structure that you can mimic actually using uh, 3D printing. But with a traditional 3D printing, we are going into the problem of the resolution. But there is the melt electrowriting approach that I mentioned before, and I'm also fascinated and, and um, we like to use it in um, our approaches. So the melt electrowriting, um, it's also connected to the, um, to the robotic stage so that you can control very nicely and easily the movement in the, in the three, dim uh, three di dimensions. And then uh, you have here the cartridge, uh, which is um, containing polymer melt. And then this melted materials, it's drawn uh, on the stage, um, not only due to the pressure, but also due to the voltage. And because we have a voltage, we can really nicely um, deposit the, the fibers, the polymer melt fibers, which are in the size of, um, let's say, five to 50 micrometers. So the, the the scale that we are using and the accuracy is much is much better that we are using for normal 3D bioprinting. So in that sense, melt electrowriting is a kind of a combination between electrospinning and 3D bioprinting or 3D printing uh, because we have a very well control on the very good control over the fiber deposition, but we are in the ranges of a fiber size closer maybe to electrospinning. And here are some examples of the structures that we were able to obtain using melt electrowriting. But we are also trying to reproduce this, um, these different regions in the human trabecular meshwork that we model. Um, and we were successful in that sense that we could uh, really um, print three separate layers, which were having uh, some uh, gradient on in the porosity and then in the mechanical properties. And these gradients in the mechanical properties were going in the same direction and were similar in the situation in the native human trabecular um, tissue. So here it, um, it is how, how the whole construct looks. Here are some more pictures which are showing that we indeed had the three different region, regions integrated in the one scaffold. And we make also some uh, culture of a uh, primary human trabecular uh, meshwork cells to see how do they behave. Um, and how they uh, grow um, during the time. So here you see also some pictures from like a later time point, so from day eight, and then you can see that they are forming like a uniform sheet on top uh, of the printing construct, and actually they are feeling there pretty well. But this is still like ongoing study, and now uh, we are all working together with Anna Hoffman to develop this model into like a really adequate in vitro model, also to test um, um, the disease and uh, how we can actually cure it with uh, medication because for the human trabecular meshwork the problem is not only that it's blocked and then people get blind but also that they are really lacking in vitro models so it's very difficult actually to test some other treatments than just cutting. Um, just to show some other examples how we are using this metal electrowriting um, technique so uh, Magda Gwadesh is working on uh, preparing from using human at, um, using um, 
uh, meta electro writing um, the blood brain barrier um, mesh, meshes. So uh, we want to reproduce uh, the, the brain br blood brain barrier, which is a highly selective membrane. Um, let's say um, built by the endothelial cells that it's restricting um, very um, selectively um, some substances to penetrate into the brain from the blood veins. And on one hand, of course, it's very good, but on the other hand, this means also, for example, if we have a tumor, it's very difficult to treat it because we cannot have the drugs that can penetrate uh, and really reach the tumor. So we want to um, recapitulate, let's say, this um, ba basement membrane and the, the, um, the, the, the area between endothelial cells and the basement membrane. And we want to see the cells, endothelial cells, and on the other side, the, the neural cells, just to see um, how we can uh, reproduce the, the B layer that it's formed. And here it's like just maybe a bit um, for fun or the, just to show that we are also having a fun in the lab that with these uh, meshes that Magda was printing, it was, uh, they were very delicate because we want to take like a super minimalistic approach that is a little of material, just enough to, to steer the cells, but the, mostly the cells will beat the contract. So it was very difficult to somehow place them in the cell culture uh, plate. So one of the ideas that in the end, it's not our final approach, but one of the idea was to actually use a pieces of Lego um, to fix the membrane and just to keep them in the place. And actually they were working pretty well. Although in the end, we, we finished with some custom made uh, and more professional setup. So what we are doing now, as I mentioned, we want to go into um, uh, co-culture and we want to, to culture endothelial cells and pericytes or uh, astrocytes together and then put them in the microfluidic chip to see the behavior of the cells uh, in the flow and to see if we can reconstruct this blood-brain barrier. And finally, finally, uh, to show one more um, application of this metal electro writing for reconstruction of more complex tissues, we are looking also on the interfacial tissues, so the connection between different types of tissue and specifically here between hard and soft tissue. So now we are looking on the connection between bone and tendon or bone and ligament. So what it's um, special for this connection is that the properties of the tissue are changing like within one millimeter or even on the shorter length scales tremendously when you look on the mechanics or biological or chemical properties. And we wanted to reproduce it also and then again uh, the, the, the length scales that uh, melt electro writing is offering us seems to fit really well. So we, we again look on the to the nature and somehow we took the inspiration again from the marine organ, organisms. So we are using, looking on these um, sponges and what is very um, beautiful about them and what is very special is that they are actually also using one material like we can use with melt electro writing, but they are changing the properties like mat uh, mechanical and biological properties just playing with, with one material and organization. And their organization that they have is actually pretty easy to model and to build up with melt electro writing. So what we want to do is we want to go into the direction of metamaterials what, where you can control the material properties, not by chemistry, but actually by the design. And our idea is that we will um, form like a highly organized architectures where we have a gradient uh, and the complexity of our design is growing um, increasing. And with this complexity, we want to also increase the stiffness uh, of the material, so change the properties and also then influence the, the area, for example, that is available for cell attachment. And this would mean that, for example, if we see different cell types, we can kind of control the behavior because of the stiffness of the material and also the cell attachment as I mentioned or the porosity the pore sizes so on some parts we want to see the fibroblast fibroblast and we we want to make this part like a, more like a soft tissue and on the other part we want to have osteoblast and in the middle chondroblast and see if, if we can maintain this um, zonal um, uh, dependency and zonal phenotype we also want to uh, see the mesenchymal stem cells and then see if they can differentiate depending on the on our material, depending on the stiffness of the material, because it was shown that uh, there are specific stiffness, uh, there's specific stiffness connected to different tissue types and that, that the cells would prefer to differentiate in different um, cell type depending on the material properties or depending on the stiffness. 
and this is the project that uh, Kozielinski is taking care of. So he's also making some like uh, more basic studies uh, for now analyzing mechanical properties and how we can actually change it depending on the design that we are employing. Um, and we, in that sense, uh, or in, in that moment, we decided also to go more into the computer simulation. Uh, and uh, Timo is working on this part. We are still pretty new in the field, but um, it, it's a kind of a very important for what we want to do now, that we can also uh, use a computer simulation to kind of predict uh, how our design will influence mechanical properties to really match not only what the cells need, but also to match the, the properties in the native tissues. Um, so that was it about advanced materials and advanced printable designs. Um, and then it was also the time to think if we can combine both, because it's nice to, of course, control uh, the, um, the cell behavior by the architecture that we offer, but it, it would be also like a double beneficial if we could put uh, precisely at some cues, like for example, bio. Uh, molecules to the to the well defined uh, spots in the construct to make them the materials even more destructive for the uh, cells so what we want to do now is we actually want to combine 3d bioprinting with melt electro writing to take advantage of both techniques uh, on one hand we want to use the bioprinting to de to deliver these um, soft materials and uh, more um, moisture environment or more um, aqueous environment, but we want to also have a precise control of the mechanical properties, but also some architectural cues uh, from melt erector written meshes. Um, and one of the projects that we are developing in this direction, um, and what actually Sixi Bu is doing, it's uh, preparing the skin models where we want to also play with the different designs um, using melt electro writing, uh, combined with a different uh, hydrogel. Um, and the different uh, cell types to, to, to go into the direction of the uh, adequate uh, in vitro models of the skin. Um, and with this, I'm, I'm coming to the, the, to the end of the talk. Um, so the future directions that we, we are, uh, that we foresee, it's besides regenerative medicine and um, in vitro testing models for some drugs. It's also uh, more uh, biology and fundamental studies on uh, that size, where we want to see how the architectural control, so these um, complex uh, structures are working in natural systems and what they are actually giving or what is the benefit of natural system from having the complex architectures, which are observed on the different levels in different organisms, mm -hmm. um, not only in animals, but also uh, in the plants. And we also want to go in the direction of robotics and electronics, especially that uh, this uh, melt electro writing is a, gives us a possibility to build uh, very precise elements with a very, on a very small scale. And with this, I, I, I am really um, in the end. So I would um, like to say that none of this work would be possible without uh, many people who were working with me in Dynamic Biomaterials Group in Germany and also uh, here uh, where I'm now in Netherlands in Kamperman lab. Uh, so I'm very grateful to all these people. And as you can see on the pictures, um, that, that, that the times are changing. So like uh, one year ago, we were all running. And this year, we, were all, we are all sitting in the front of our computers. But still, I, I enjoy the, the working in the group, which is nice. Um, and to, to really finish, I wanted to kind of make a connection with the L'Oreal Prize that was given to acknowledge and scientific work and the family activities. So I wanted to also add that uh, it's not all about uh, sitting in the lab, but uh, I'm also a pretty active person and I really enjoy it too. And I had a lot of inspiration from what I'm doing in my everyday life besides uh, the lab. Um, uh, and I'm also grateful to my family for, for the support they are giving to me. And with this, uh, I, I'm very grateful that uh, you are listening to me, and I'm very happy to ask, to, to answer any question that you may ask. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Garcia, uh, for your nice presentation. Interesting. You do lots of uh, uh, stuff in uh, different directions. So. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. I start with the audience question and then uh, 
Mohsen, and then we get back to, to, to the audience again. Uh, first, uh, one of our audience uh, is asking, uh, so the adhesive that using chelating materials uh, to, met, uh, to, to attach to metal is pH dependent. So they can be released by cells growth as you change the pH. What's your thought about this uh, in terms of uh, the adhesive material? Yeah, so it, it, it's true that it's a pH dependent. But of course, I mean, it's it's giving you a possibility like to make it switchable also. But then, of course, if you are thinking about biomaterials, the pH will also influence you the, the, the uh, for example, cell viability, right? So um, I don't know if that was a question or if what's the kind of uh, also like an uh, inspirational thought, but indeed you could make it at um, switchable, but then, um, then again, like you need to change all the parameters. You need to think which metal you want to use, and then what is the influence of this metal on the cells. But uh, yeah, yeah, that, that could be a very nice option, actually. Thank you so much. Uh, Mohsen is asking another Mohsen. Another yeah. Mohsen is asking, <laughs> how long is the cure time for bio ink in order to rebuild its crosslink bound after it has been injected? Yeah, so it, it really depends. And I mean, the, um, it's the best, the quickest it is, the best it is. But then you need to also have it uh, like uh, nicely rearranged in the moment when it's in the needle. And I think that's the whole story about that. If you can make it very quickly responsive, that's, that's the perfect um, uh, situation. And what we observe in this vanadium, um, it, it was forming like a more rigid structure and we could build higher objects in that dimension, but the lines themselves were not so smooth. So here the, mm, the time span was actually like below one second. The, when you look for the rheological properties, below one second everything could be reformed. But this means that also not every, mm, not all the uh, bonds were, uh, uh, the crosslinks were relaxed in the needle. So you don't have such a beautiful and smooth strands when you are printing. And aluminum was on the other edge, so you have a very smooth and nice um, strands printed because the relaxation time uh, was faster, but then um, it didn't keep the shape so well. So it took longer time actually until it, it, it can um, recover. So I would say um, if, it's, if it's below one second, that's nice, but then it causes some other effects that maybe you don't have such a nice and smooth strands. Thank you very much. Uh, Duna uh, is asking about the, uh, I think, melt electro writing process. Uh, she's, she says that uh, uh, on a smaller scale, the orientation and microscopic organization of the ECM determines the patterns of differentiation of cells, uh, of cells uh, and the membranes function. Can we control the pattern of uh, things as small as collagen and cells while printing with the uh, melt electrowriting, like having parallel strand of protein? I don't. Uh, I think uh, we don't use uh, protein in melt electrowriting. We use more uh, PCL, PLA, and other materials. Yeah, yeah. Mostly. So the, the the difficulty here with melt electrowriting will be that you need to, that you use high temperatures. Although recently yeah. I saw also the, the papers where they were mixing a protein with polycaprolactone and that was giving some adhesive cues. And again, we are also not exactly on the same level that we have uh, for the proteins in ECM. So we are still talking about the strands in the dimension of a few micrometers um, in, the, in the diameter. So it's not the same level. So it's more like that we want to um, have the same effect that uh, we have from ECM, but not really using uh, exactly the same structure. So we want to kind of um, uh, change the, the, the architecture and change the complexity, but we, we are we, with this technique, we are still quite far from really uh, mimicking the, the native ECM. Great, yes. Uh, Timuti is asking you, uh, uh, congratulations on building up the very interesting research lines. Maybe I missed it. Uh, what the motivation for choosing uh, iron or uh, vanadium or aluminium in, in particular? Yeah, so we, we choose these three because um, they are at a physiological pH 
they have a completely different properties in uh, in regards to the crosslink or uh, they are uh, doing so uh, aluminum is mostly uh, connected to, to one so it's making mono or maybe bis association and then uh, with uh, iron we will have uh, usually two chains connected to the um, to the metal and with vanadium we have the we have a three of them so in that sense we can control and they have also different dynamics so in that sense we can control the strength um of the of the cross linking and how these uh, ligands connect to the metal so th that was um we, we choose those because we knew that they will give us things with completely different properties but that's true that we could choose something else but uh, yeah but that was the primary reason um Thank you so much. Uh, Li Khan is asking uh, if we can uh, combine two techniques, electrospinning and uh, extrusion-based uh, printing for creating the structures for biomedical application. Have you ever tried that or is it possible to do that? In the to same combine. machine, in the same machine, yeah. Uh, electros, well, um, um, I don't know if we can, if it's uh, about melt electrowriting or electrospinning, because I think he said electrospinning, right? So maybe yeah, that's... he's he's talking about electrospinning. Maybe uh, I mean electrowriting is kind of uh, printing, but he's yes. talking electrospinning and uh, extrusion-based printing. Yeah. Okay, but so I will try to answer kind of both. Mm -hmm. So uh, bioprinting you can combine within one machine in, with melt electrowriting, and for example. Uh, Reganu or Gassim, they are like uh, commercially available um, companies that they are selling uh, combined devices. There is also one more company that I'm, I'm very sure, but I forgot the name, it's a Turkish one, that they are also developing this. And I heard from some other companies that they are growing interest, that there is growing interest to, to have like a one device that combine both. So it is possible. And there are also many groups that they are building their own setups. Um, so yes in that sense yes you could also say okay to some extent you can uh, achieve a similar effect to electro spinning using melt electro writing if you like um, properly adjust the parameters so if if somebody would really like to obtain uh, electro spoon mesh and print it on the same stage that um, uh, that you that you use that um, bioprinting that could also be an option but uh, with with this bioprinting i think when the group is skilled and you have some engineers it's also very smart um to to just build up your own setup and then you can i'm sure that you can combine it that's great thank you so much <clears throat> uh the darul uh, is asking uh, could you comment on the advantages of uh, this fundamental uh, question these melt electro writing and uh, electro spinning or regular solvent based uh, electro spin So uh, I um, didn't get exactly the question. So uh, the question, uh, the, the the comparison between the melt electro writing and the uh, electro spinning okay, solvent spinning. based electro spinning, and what is that? What are the advantages of uh, melt yeah. electro writing over the electro spinning? Yeah. So um, they're kind of a different, right? So um, there are some advantages of both. Uh, when when so it's not that you. I would say oh, one is better than the other. But for melt electro writing, what is uh, interesting is, I mean, first of all, you don't have the uh, the solvent, which can be a plus because you don't need to worry about any residues. And then, the, for example, the toxicity is not your problem. And uh, it's very important that you don't have the solvent because for melt electro writing, you, you need to have a material with a higher viscosity uh, to obtain this nice straight flow that you, the, the, the thread that you can control how it's deposited on the platform. And that's the other thing that you can really precisely deposit it. You, you don't have this control with um, electro spinning. You can use the different types of collectors, and then you have to some extent uh, well controlled fibers. But it's not the same level of the the control that you have with melt electro writing. So I would say that that's the main advantage: how well and how precisely you can position your fibers. And this is mostly what we want to ut utilize in our research. Yes, thank you. And the last question from audience, and I encourage everybody just uh, to continue asking questions if you have any. Uh, Ven uh, Venkata is asking what micro uh, architectural cues do you control to improve the cell adhesion? Uh, I don't get really what's the bottom of the question, but uh, I don't I know. Get 
Yeah, I yeah. guess that of it. I think that the question is because I, I indeed says that we want to control uh, the cells by the architecture only at some point. So I guess that the reason for the question is um, the reasoning for the it, it behind it's uh, how we want to control adhesion by just the design. And that's mm -hmm. true that the adhesion itself by the design, what we could do is that we, for example, increase some roughness in the material and that, that there are ways to do it also. Uh, but that's true that in that sense, um, the, the approach which we say that like combining and material and uh, design is helping. So in, in that sense, we are thinking, first of all, it, it's just an easy approach to make some coating, but we are also indeed thinking about these possibilities to combine, for example, PCL with some proteins uh, or just with RGDs, uh, so the, the moieties that are improving the cell attachment to have this incorporated into the system. Because for now, we are mostly using multi writing to print some structures and then we incubate them uh, in some adhesive protein or EFBS uh, in FBS to, to have a better cell attachment. And I mean, it's, it's a very interesting question in that sense that when you look for some of the structures which we are printing, the, there are pretty big pores. So actually, most of the cells will go through. So, it, so it's an issue to, to have a nice adhesion with, them, with the multi writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. I see that Mohsen is ready with lots of questions. Please go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, so, Gosha, very nice presentation. I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, it's it's a, uh, it's a it's a very interesting field, uh, an area that uh, and that you're working on, especially combining bioprinting and uh, uh, melt electro spinning. Is, is uh, very interesting to me. Uh, I have a few questions regarding the uh, the translational application of these. Uh, 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 you know these materials and the constructs, uh, and uh, uh, that, that that you're working on. Uh, uh, my my main uh, my first question is about the printable glues that you discussed. These these glues are intended to be uh, used in uh, uh, in during surgery eventually, uh, and uh, or implanted eventually in in the body. Uh, so the questions that I have is. Uh, about the concept of uh, uh, biocompatibility in the context of interacting the material with the human body and then the immune response and, and the irritation and uh, sensitizations that these kinds of materials may cause when they become in contact with the body. What are your thoughts on these kinds of uh, uh, properties on, on these kinds of, you know, responses of, of the material when it's in contact with, with the human body. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I think it's a it's a very important thing that and a very important aspect. And we are not yet there with the material, but um, it's it's something that it's it's indeed very important because one one thing is how the cells behave on it, but uh, the other thing is what will happen when we really put it in the body. And also, what is the influence? For example, some people were saying, okay, but you are using dopamine, and maybe that has, a, for example, a bad influence of your neurons, uh, uh, neuronal system. But uh, in that sense, for example, we use a very small amount of dopamine. So it's, it's a very like um, small amount um, of functionalization. And in that sense, we are also using polyethylene glycol, which should be, in principle, okay. But of course, it's something that, that should be investigated further. Fantastic. So, so this is uh, this is uh, very interesting, and then uh, to know that again, I mean, I mean, dopamine also uh, 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 may be released eventually from the material, uh, and that that's uh, that's a good segue to my next question, uh, and that's about the degradation of this material. Uh, and and uh, uh, I, I wonder if you studied the degradation rate of this material, and then also if. Uh, if you have collected uh, like the material, the degraded material to see the byproducts of this, uh, like what components degrade faster, what components degrade slower, and then how, what are the implications in terms of cell toxicity and, and immune response? Yeah, so that's, uh, we, we didn't um, really study too much about the, the degradation the composition, so what is released. Um, the materials are pretty stable. And you can also kind of combine not only this metal ligand, uh, you use not only metal ligand cross-linking and dynamic cross-linking, you can also use a covalent cross-linking. Mm -hmm. So there are some possibilities to make it more or less stable. 
and as I mentioned, and, and dopamine, I mean, it can be released, but it's it's still like a, a really, it, it's not free there, right? So it's connected to the polyethylene glycol chains, and it's really interacting all the time with the material. So um, I would not expect that it's just going freely there, but it will really, if it's released, it will be bind still to the metal ions. So the, the, the then says, I think the activity of it or the negative impact will be will be decreased. Um, what we check, as I mentioned, was the metal ions. So that was what was what was more worrying us a bit more. That when they are released, for example, in case of vanadium, you can see like a locally a um, negative effect, for example, on the cells. Um, viability okay more thing uh may i add something i mean if if even here the byproduct is not that dangerous it's dopamine it makes you happier <laughs> yes, <they're really> happy. <laughs> just just a joke yeah no i agree but uh again i mean i mean all these uh tissue constructs that uh, that that are developed eventually the and for because uh, there are two applications one is for uh, for disease modeling that's another story but this is yeah. for the particular application for for like organ transplantation and implantation uh, so this is something that is a consideration and then uh, and I think and I, it's, it's good to see that the material is stable so so the idea so so my uh, what I gather from 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 uh, from your talk and then your uh, your answer to the question is that these are these materials are designed to be permanently implanted in the body, uh, so they do not uh, degrade over time and then they'll stay in place uh, for extended period. So that's great. And then, if uh, needed, they can like they could be a secondary surgery to remove them, uh, maybe. Uh, or it could be also that at some point we just. Um add some um, degradable moieties into into the system so that you could control but of course then you you have this release in the body okay that's very good that's very good. so so now my next question is about the the source of materials that you're using so so uh so when i was when i was reading your bio sketch i, I learned that you are you were working on recombinant uh, materials recombinant proteins and then, uh, so I wanted to to learn more uh, about your thoughts on on the use of recombinant materials for three D printing, three D bioprinting, and then uh, and then what are their implications in in the clinical translation of these materials eventually into the body? Yeah. So uh, I was working with the recombinant proteins uh, before I switched to the three D bioprinting. And actually, in a 3D bioprinting, I kind of like a bit more the synthetic approach, but uh, it's like my uh, personal preference. And also because they are much easier to functionalize and that we can uh, maybe like uh, in in quicker, but maybe in a more dirty way to change them because with the with this recombinant protein, the nice thing is that the old job is not done by us, but in that case, it was done by yeast or by bacteria. Mm -hmm. So you have like a perfect control and the... Uh, and you can see, uh, so, so the, the, the monodispersity of the material is, of course, much better. And then you really know what you, what you obtain. So in that sense, I would say that they are very interesting for 3D bioprinting. But then I think that from the regulatory perspective, they would be much more difficult to, to, do, to get an agreement to, for the translation. So um, I, I still think that it would be interesting. Uh, and at some point, I think that might be my focus. But um, I kind of like also this synthetic approach, as I mentioned, because it's easier. Uh, and, and I also think that uh, in the people perspective, when something is recombinant, sometimes it just uh, immediately this uh, not positive thought that, oh, maybe that's uh, unknown and that's not so uh, nice to use. So in that sense, uh, I'm more on the synthetic side now. Okay, that's that's that that's great. And then, uh, so, so, so then, uh, then, uh, uh, you're not planning to use any materials from animal sources uh, uh, because there has been some uh, uh, recently when I'm communicating with, with companies who are trying to develop these technologies, they are trying to move away from animal materials, uh, you know, uh, with animal sources, and then they're moving more towards human-based materials for, you know, uh, like the... Uh, uh, the to avoid the projections and then you know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, Although I need to also say that by now we are working uh, with some, um, I don't know, like for example, a collagen. So we, we are also working from the animal derivatives by now. But I think that uh, that is going more into the direction to, to go a bit farther away from the animal derivatives. Okay, that's that, that's great. So my 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 next question, since there are no more questions in the Q and A box, then I have I keep asking questions until yeah. woman says a stop. Yeah. So okay. um, <laughs> so my next question is about the meta materials that you uh, you discussed. That's, that's a very interesting concept. Um, so I have uh, my first question is about the uh, the surface topography. Uh, and then the effect of surface topography uh, uh, on the cellular behavior, especially that uh, you uh, propose to use the stem cells, and then stem cells are pretty sensitive to the uh, to this uh, microstructure of the surface, micro and nanostructure of the surface. And it's very nice that you can control the microstructure uh, in a wide range. I'm, I'm I'm not quite sure if you can go down to nano features uh, yet with this system, but. Uh, but uh, still, it's nice that you can cover a wide range. Uh, so what are your thoughts on the effect of topography uh, uh, and the synergistic effect of surface topography and, and also the stiffness on the, on the cellular behavior in the context of stem cell differentiation? Yeah, so I think, uh, so just first going to the, 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 the first part of what you said. So um, indeed, we cannot control like uh, very well, the, like to the nano range, we don't have this control. Um, because the, the fibers we can we can obtain like the smallest one are maybe I, I mean there are some research that they are showing that you can go below one micrometer but it's not so common and so in that sense maybe we don't have like a full control but of course you can still uh, later on introduce some kind of a roughness and I think that what is nice that it's not only that we can control the stiffness and the uh, uh, the roughness, but we all also have an influence on the overall architecture. So, for example, how big we are making the shape. So, where these cells have a contact, and it's not only about the MSCs, but it's also, for example, when you think about the, the cells which are polar, polarized, um, that you can like endothelial cells in the veins. You can tell them more or less, let's say, in which direction they should go. If they should go along with the vein, or they they can go in the perpendicular way, or some or in different way. So that's something that we want to also utilize and, and uh, see how we can how we can control then the differentiation, but also uh, the grow and the um, the polarization. Okay, that's very nice. And uh, of course, there is. Uh, uh, I, I just sorry. <laughs> the, there was one more thought that came to my mind. That what we want to do is also to include, for example, some inorganic particles in the in the print, and then then you can expect that you will have uh, some uh, some surface roughness, or that you can influence also the surface. So that the, the, the let's say nanotopography or microtopography on the strands that you are printing, or uh, maybe uh, I don't know if you can change your. I mean, somehow have a special spray net with the grooves or something on inside the spray net. Yeah. Mohsen is the yeah. expert in this. <laughs> he already did that. So. <laughs> uh, well, uh, well, thanks, Ruben, uh, for the hint. Uh, so my, my other... Uh, my, that's going to be my last question. So, so the material, uh, it's about the... Uh, the glue, uh, the surgical glue uh, uh, that you, you 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 developed and then you're working on at the moment. Uh, so my question is again from the translational side of this. Uh, so we talked about the uh, the biocompatibility uh, of the material, but one thing that is that uh, uh, that uh, I'm interested to know is the the cost of this material. So, and then also the scalability of creating this material. So what are your thoughts on the cost? Because uh, I saw that you compared the properties with uh, uh, mm, yeah. uh, with with, uh, with uh, pepperin base and then also uh, 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 the other, the synthetic glue, I forgot the name. Uh, I remembered it, but yes, and I collect, yeah. and I uh, so, so what is the range of the cost of this material and, and, uh, 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 and then also the ability to, uh, to scale it up for? Yeah, so I would say maybe not, it's not a killing question, but, <laughs> but indeed it, it would be a kind of a um, difficulty here. So it's, it's not the cheapest option. And I mean, 
it also depends, right? Because, for example, for the, the cell studies that I, I showed, I, I didn't want to go too much into the chemistry, but we also add some RGDs because polyethylene glycol itself, it will not yeah. promote the cell uh, adherence and growth. So then it all, that this increased the cost tremendously. But yeah. if we just want to use it without RGDs, then it's not so bad. And like um, what is also interesting and important is that we are using like 5% solution. So there is not so much uh, polyethylene and glycol. So mm -hmm. in that sense, um, and, and, and I imagine that um, you are not uh, using like uh, really liters of this, uh, of this glue. So in that sense, it would be still in a similar range. It would be um, more expensive than fibrin, for example, or fibrinogen, but uh, still it would be doable. But uh, of course, the more into the into the complexity you are, you are going, and the more bio functional you want to make it, then the, the price increase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I promise that that was my last question, but I have another question, <laughs> follow up question, uh, and that's about the again from from the translational aspect of this. Uh, so eventually, these materials are going to be, uh, you know. Uh, uh, implanted in the body or be in contact with the cells and, and you don't want this uh, and you want to sterilize this material so what are your thoughts on the uh, sterilization methods that can be used uh, for uh, uh, you know for, for sterilizing this material before use in uh, uh, in human or uh, uh, maybe uh, with cells yeah, so we are sterilizing it like uh, before making the final hydrogel. So that was helpful because all we have uh, already like the sterilized powder or we were using the UV treatment of the like uh, powder um, uh, compounds. And then uh, afterwards we were not sterilizing anymore. Okay. Um, so that was our, let's say, way around this. Okay. So I would imagine that you deliver the, the materia, which is already like a sterile to the doctor in the kind of application uh, tube or application pen. Mm -hmm. But then uh, what I wanted to mention when, when we are thinking about translational approach or this perspective, what it's nice from the material that I shown is that this metal writing is pretty cheap. So for example, what we show with the, with the implants that could work for this human trabecular meshwork, yeah. that's something that you could buy a super cheap. So in that sense, it's a, it's a very attractive thing. It is, it is. And I can imagine that it's just quite a scalable as well in terms of... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 so, so regarding um, a follow-up question on the sterilization uh, approach that you used, uh, uh, was there any concerns uh, when you used uh, UV light uh, in, in terms of degrading the material uh, when, when, when the UV, uh, like at the intensities or the times that you used? Uh, for uh, for the sterilization process. Yeah, exactly. So that could be a case. So we were not doing it for a very prolonged time, but okay. indeed that's something that uh, we would need to check exactly how long we can do it without having any degradation within the polymer. Yeah. That's fair. Okay, great. I have no more questions. Thank you so much. I know that uh, you mentioned that there is a curfew, like uh, Montreal also we have curfew at 8 o'clock, so, and you have to <coughs> kind of run uh, to, I mean, yeah, I'm going to <coughs> yes, so, so I don't have any else other questions. Run to the car, yes. <laughs> yeah, we don't have any other question from audience, and uh, it was really nice having you, and uh, we really enjoyed the interesting presentation and the technology you're working, and hopefully we hear from you uh, soon with the newer results and all these, uh, you know, cool, cool technologies. So just before closing the, the session, I would like to also again uh, uh, talk about our next speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, professor Carl Eric Oman. Uh, he is a professor of biomedical engineering in uh, Polytechnic Montreal, and uh, he's a CEO and scientific director of Montreal Transmit Tech. And uh, he's gonna talk about the uh, the technologies that he's uh, developing in his lab and how he uh, kind of uh, found and, uh, you know, uh, from his lab found the Transmet Tech community uh, to do the transdisciplinary innovation ecosystem. So by that, uh, I would like to thank everybody to join us and, uh, and wish you all the best and please take care uh, wherever you are and have a great uh, time. <laughs> 
Bye -bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Gosia. Take care. Thank you, Human. Bye. Thank you, Musa. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.